This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Tonight on Unsolved Mysteries, the poignant saga of Amelia Earhart. 53 years ago, she vanished in the South Pacific during a round-the-world flight. But eyewitness accounts suggest that Amelia Earhart may have survived and been captured by the Japanese Navy. In Woodstock, Illinois, Colleen Ritter and Rick Church were typical high school sweethearts until their romance went sour. Now, Colleen's parents are dead and Rick Church has disappeared. Using an electronic store as a front, FBI agents in Florida go undercover to capture the kingpins of a South American drug ring, a real life story of Miami Vice. Also, we will present a follow-up to our story about a popular 16-year-old girl who mysteriously vanished from Sable Forks, New York. Last year, she was apparently in Los Angeles at a concert for the musical group New Kids on the Block, and may even have been captured on film in their rock video. Perhaps you can help find Carrie Lynn Nixon. Two years ago, we examined the strange disappearance of a 16-year-old girl. Tonight, an update on her case and an urgent appeal from her family and members of the teenage recording group, New Kids on the Block. Carrie Lynn Nixon was an above-average student and well-known and liked in the small community of O Sable Forks, New York. At around 10 p.m. on June 22, 1987, Carrie was returning home after running an errand for her father. A few minutes later, and only 700 feet from her doorstep, Carrie Lynn Nixon disappeared. My immediate reaction was terror, and it's been a nightmare ever since. Was Carrie's disappearance the result of foul play, or had she simply run away? Carrie wrote some letters to a friend and in these letters, she indicated she would like to live in Hawaii, live, move to Florida, possibly California, and in fact, leave the town of Osable Forks when she turned 18. My theory on this case is Carrie Lynn Nixon was abducted. Her father gave her $20 for groceries. She went to Thomas' store for her father, left Thomas' store with the bag of groceries. If she was a runaway, she would have done none of those things. She would have been dressed better, she would have taken money with her that she had in her bedroom after we searched her bedroom. She is a victim of a kidnapping. Authorities investigated dozens of reported sightings of Carrie, but were unable to confirm her identity. Nothing has been found, not one thing. She's walked off the face of the earth, as far as we're concerned. As the years in the investigation dragged on, Carrie's parents began to give up hope of ever finding their daughter. But all that changed in March of this year when they saw a videotape of a concert given by the popular singing group New Kids on the Block. On June 5, 1989, the group filmed their Hangin' Tough Live concert in Los Angeles, California. Among the crowd of teenage fans, Kathy and Gary Nixon saw a familiar face. We couldn't believe how much that this girl looked like our daughter. So we just kept rewinding it and going over and over and over, and we just couldn't believe it because we never really had any hope that she was alive. And then this, there's this girl that looks so much like her. I'm not 100% convinced, but it looks like. Mark Harry. Uh, upon viewing the tape, 
I picked the girl out immediately the first time it ran through. It was obvious to me uh, that this girl did look like Carrie Nixon and it appeared to be her. This detail-enhanced photograph was made from the videotape and compared with a picture of Carrie taken shortly before she disappeared. There's obviously many similarities. The hair length, the hair color, the shape of the face, the chin, the mouth, and it displayed a multiple of earrings in the right ear, in which Carrie Nixon has four earrings in her right ear and two on her left. So the uh, photo-enhanced finished product further convinced the Nixons that this could be their daughter. Members of the new kids on the block did not recognize the girl in the crowd, but after hearing Carrie's story, wanted to make a personal appeal. Well, I'd just like to say to Carrie that if you're out there, the best thing to do would just be to call somebody and, you know, even if you go to your local police and just just tell them your situation that maybe they can help you out. Or if any of you viewers out there who have seen her at a new kid show or just seen her on the street, if you could contact someone, you know, to, to let them know where she is or if she's all right or anything, that would be a big help. We need to find this girl, find out who she is, whether it's Carrie or not, just so that if it's not, we can go on to something else to try and find her. I love you, Carrie. I need to talk to you. Six decades ago, Amelia Earhart was one of the most famous women in the world. She had the figure of a movie star and the face of an angelic tomboy. The first woman to pilot an aircraft across the Atlantic in 1932, Amelia defied labels and definitions. Part all-American girl, part daredevil, she was a perfect hero for her time. But she was also ahead of her time, a self-effacing yet outspoken champion of women's rights. Two men are women. A pilot's a pilot. I hope that such equality could be carried out in other fields so that men and women may achieve equally in any endeavor they set out. On May 20th, 1937, Amelia Earhart and her navigator, Fred Noonan, prepared for takeoff from Oakland, California. Amelia was 39 years old. This flight was designed to be the capstone of her brilliant career as an aviator. She was attempting to become the first person, man or woman, to fly around the world at its widest point, the equator. Today, 53 years later, new evidence has deepened the mystery surrounding Amelia Earhart's last flight. The first leg of Amelia's flight was via Burbank to Tucson. From there, she went on to New Orleans, Miami, Puerto Rico, Venezuela, and Brazil. Amelia and Fred then crossed the Atlantic, landing in Senegal on the African coast. They made several short hops across Africa, then headed for Karachi in what is now Pakistan. From there to Calcutta, Rangoon, Singapore, and two stops in Java, then Australia, and finally, Leh, New Guinea. Amelia and Fred had flown almost two-thirds of the way around the world, and they'd done it fairly quickly. They must have been very tired when they got to Leh, New Guinea. They had two days there. They tried to rest up. But after that amount of flying time, they must have been exhausted. And here they were facing the most difficult leg of their flight. From New Guinea, Amelia and Fred faced a grueling 18 hours in the air. They also had to hit an inconceivably tiny target, Howland Island. Howland is just a mile and a half long and a half mile wide. At its highest point, the island is only 20 feet above sea level, about half the height of a telephone pole. The difficulty factor on a scale of 1 to 10, piloting from Leh, New Guinea to Howland Island in 1937 in that aircraft, make it a 10, the most difficult. It would be like flying across the United States and locating the 18th green of a golf course in New Jersey. On July 1st, 1937, 
Amelia Earhart and Fred Newman prepared to leave New Guinea. Squalls were predicted along their route. They decided to postpone takeoff. Amelia wired her husband that she would not make it back to Oakland on the 4th of July as planned. At precisely 10 a.m. on the 2nd of July, Amelia and Fred took off. They planned to cross the international date line and land on Howland Island 18 hours later. Though she had the best navigator in the world sitting beside her, Fred Noonan, she was responsible for running that airplane. She had to fly the heading. She had to watch the weather. She had to watch the fuel flows. She had to watch the mixtures, the carburetor air, make sure they weren't getting carburetor ice. She was responsible for the airplane maintaining altitude and maintaining trim. All these things were constant. Plus, she had to do the radio transmissions. Amelia was not competent where radio was concerned. She would never take the time to learn properly. I think it can be honestly said that the radio was the Achilles heel of that flight. It may seem incredible now, but in 1937, before radar came into use, a battery-powered radio was Amelia's only link with the world. Plying the waters around Howland Island, the Coast Guard cutter Itasca stood ready to communicate by radio with Amelia as soon as she came within range. With a radio bearing, the Itasca could rescue Amelia and Fred at sea should anything go wrong. For 16 hours, nothing did. Then, Amelia's lack of radio expertise came into play. About 17 hours and 14 minutes into the flight, now we're really getting to the critical part. She reports that she's approximately 200 miles out, and she wants them to take a radio bearing on her, and she whistles into the microphone. Want bearing on 310. Stop whistling. Amelia did not whistle long no, enough to give the Itasca a consistent signal. What Amelia failed to understand yeah, was that whistling wasn't necessary. Simply allowing an uninterrupted radio signal to play for 30 seconds would have been enough. Please repeat last transmission on 7500. I repeat. 19 hours into the flight and one hour behind schedule, Amelia and Fred calculated that they should be directly above Howland Island, where they had also established clear radio contact. Looking down, they saw only ocean. Fred, I don't see Howland Island. I don't know where it is. We should be right on top of it. It's not on my side. I don't see it here either. Something was badly wrong. Only once had Amelia indicated that she could hear the Itasca, even though they could hear her perfectly. Again, all Amelia had to do was open her radio line to let a signal play so the Itasca could take a bearing and find out how far off course she was. Instead, Amelia stopped her radio transmissions. She had overused the radio and drained her battery on a flight the year before, so she was reluctant simply to let the transmitter run. They know they've missed the island, gone past it, but they don't know which side. They have no way of knowing. They have to take a radio bearing. So Amelia does the only thing she can. 20 hours and 13 minutes into the flight, Amelia sends her last message. Her voice is talking very rapidly and very tense. 137, we'll repeat message. We will repeat this message on 6210. In her final radio message, Amelia said she was switching frequencies to 6210 kilocycles. The Itasca could not reach her on that frequency. They assumed that Amelia, once again unfamiliar with emergency radio procedure, had turned her radio dial to the wrong setting. Frantically, the Itasca tried other frequencies with no luck. Earhart, this is the Itasca. Come in, over. We have an emergency. Notify all the ships in the area. Amelia Earhart's plane may be going down. We may be losing her. That was the last verified transmission ever heard from Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan. They must have ran out of fuel, and within a minute or two, from a 1,000 feet would have had to ditch the airplane into the ocean. Immediately, a search effort began, the largest ever mounted to look for a single plane. 10 ships, 65 airplanes, and 4,000 men covered this 250,000 square mile area around Howland Island. 
the search continued for 16 days. Experts agreed that Amelia's plane with its empty gas tanks would have floated for five to eight hours. On the plane, Amelia and Fred had life preservers and a two-person inflatable life raft equipped with emergency supplies so they could have been afloat for days. Experts believe Amelia went down somewhere near Howland Island. But incredibly, unconfirmed sightings have placed Amelia and Fred 2,500 miles west-northwest of Howland on Saipan in the Mariana Islands. When Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan disappeared, Saipan was an important military headquarters for the Japanese. Intent on expanding its empire, Japan was about to attack China and had begun to build up military operations on key islands in the South Pacific. July 1944, seven years after Amelia Earhart's plane vanished, the island of Saipan was now controlled by American forces. Sergeant Thomas Devine was a member of the 244th Army Unit. I first became aware of matter pertaining to Amelia Earhart soon after my arrival on the island. Lieutenant Liebig, who was our first lieutenant, had secured a jeep and told me that I was to drive him to Asnito Airfield, which was a short distance away from our bivouac area. Devine and the lieutenant drove along a heavily guarded road. They pulled up in front of a padlocked aircraft hangar. I'm sorry, sir, this is a restricted area. Restricted to whom? With all due respect, sir, that's none of your concern. It's While he waited, Thomas Devine overheard snatches of conversation from a nearby group of Marines. We got Amelia Earhart's plane in that hangar. You guys wouldn't believe it when we found it. Suddenly, an official in civilian clothes reprimanded the Marines. You people want to knock off the chatter here? Do you understand what's going on? This is a classified project. You've come about that damn close to compromising the project right now. I'm telling you, I want you to sit down, do your jobs, and shut up. Do you understand? As we went back, uh, we dropped the subject because it was just a minor incident that took place. Later on that same day, I heard a, a roar from the airfield. But we didn't pay too much attention until suddenly it came overhead very, very low. And you could see the markings on it. It was not a military plane. It was a civilian plane. The marking was very evident, NR-16020. We all looked up. We all wondered what in the world was going on. Thomas Devine wrote down the identification numbers on the aircraft. They corresponded exactly to the numbers on Amelia Earhart's plane. That same evening, Tom saw the plane again. Now, it was on fire. And I was aghast to see this plane, the so-called Earhart plane, engulfed in flames. I saw that plane personally on three occasions that day. The last time the plane was in flames. At about the same time, Bob Wallach was one of the Marines stationed on Saipan. Well, I was in the 1st Battalion, 29th Marines. We were in the second wave going into Saipan. During the daytime, we had nothing to do except look around, souvenir hunting. We're looking through some government-looking buildings, brick buildings. We found this safe that was there. One of the guys was a demolition person that knew, and he thought he could blow the door off the safe, and we'd have something. We thought we'd be millionaires, you know. But anyway, there was a briefcase that I grabbed, and I thought I had it packed full of money or something like that. To my surprise, it was something I didn't expect to see, but it was full of Amelia Earhart's papers. Hey, Joe, come take a look at this. What do you got, Wallach? Amelia Earhart. What's this stuff doing here? I may have only been 18 years old, but I knew I had a piece of history in my hand. 
This is incredible. Hey, I think you're gonna have to turn that stuff in. Yeah. Wallach turned the briefcase and its contents over to a commanding officer. He never saw it again. That briefcase is still someplace in this country. I believe that. Because that officer that I gave it to was a high enough rank that he didn't just take it and throw it away. He had something valuable, too. I do not believe Amelia Earhart died at sea. I think Amelia Earhart survived the downing on an island in the... Buddy Brennan has been investigating the Amelia Earhart mystery for more than 11 years. In 1987, he interviewed a woman in Saipan who said she had witnessed Amelia's death. Unsolved Mysteries went to Saipan and interviewed the same woman. What follows is excerpted from both interviews. This woman was brought ashore by the Japanese. It was said they had captured two spy people. The Japanese soldiers brought the spies into town. Many of us went there to see them. I think they want us to strip. The Japanese guards made them take off all their clothes, everything they had on their bodies. It was then we could see that one of the spies was a woman. I had never known before a woman who wore men's trousers. All the things that happened to that woman. The soldiers put her in jail. They removed her jewelry from her hands. Then the Japanese came and gave her rice. She threw it out. When they took her out of the prison, they tied her hands. They blindfolded her. I was working on a farm. I saw a Japanese motorcycle. The woman was in a little seat on the side of the motorcycle. I watched and they took her to this place where a hole had been dug. They made her kneel in front of the hole. Then they shot her. Ute! I planted a breadfruit tree near her grave. In 1987, Buddy Brennan conducted an excavation of the gravesite. He was only allowed to dig for 12 hours. We got down to six and a half feet below what they said would have been the surface in 1944, which is the date Ms. Bloss gave us of having witnessed the execution. And that's where we retrieved the blindfold. Brennan believes this tattered fragment of cloth was a blindfold worn by Amelia Earhart. However, no human remains were unearthed. What really happened in Saipan? Was Amelia Earhart executed here? Was her aircraft burned here on an American airfield? If so, who burned it and why? Or did Amelia Earhart and Fred Newman go down with their plane and perish somewhere in the vast South Pacific. I am convinced that the most probable end to the Amelia Earhart flight ended with them running out of fuel, just like they'd said on the radio, and just like the official accident investigation report indicated from Captain Noyes on the Lexington, that they were forced to ditch northwest of Howland Island after their fuel was exhausted, and they couldn't find Howland Island because of a navigational error. 
Now, we know they weren't any... Elgin Long believes Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan ran into three problems. The United States nautical charts Fred was using had mislocated Howland Island by six miles. A faulty compass on their aircraft took them seven miles farther off course. Finally, wind drifts and related factors pushed them another 22 miles west. According to Elgin Long, Amelia and Fred ended up a full 35 miles off course. I stick with where the airplane went down. What happened to Amelia, I'm really not positive about, and we won't know until we locate the airplane. I think if we can raise her airplane and prove once and for all the solution to the Mary Lee Earhart mystery, it will be something very, very worthwhile for our heritage. We can't afford to throw our heroes away. Many believe that the mystery of Amelia Earhart could be solved simply by a deep sea diving expedition. Perhaps so. Or perhaps Amelia Earhart is destined to remain a legendary figure, a hero suspended in time at the apex of an unsolved mystery. When we return, the chilling tale of a teenager who apparently embarked on a murderous rampage when his girlfriend broke up with him. Ray and Ruth Ann Ritter grew up in Woodstock, Illinois, a small town north of Chicago. They married in 1968 and had three children, Colleen, Steve, and Matthew. The Ritters were a close-knit family, strong churchgoers and community workers. When 15-year-old Colleen began to date a childhood friend, Rick Church, it seemed only natural. Colleen and Rick were both students at a small Catholic high school. At first, their relationship seemed like a typical teenage infatuation. Hi, Rick. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. How was school? I first started dating Rick uh, when I was a sophomore. At that point, he was a senior. I think I did okay on my test. Yeah? yeah I did. Rick was really good looking. He um, was involved in sports activities. He was real quiet, though. He had a lot of friends, but he was real quiet. It's not a, a fun position to be in. It. A year after Colleen and Rick began dating, Rick went away to college. For Colleen, the romance began to cool. The waning of young love is an everyday occurrence. Fortunately, most teenage hearts mend quickly. In the case of Colleen Ritter and Rick Church, however, something went wrong, very wrong. Rick seemed unable to accept the idea that the courtship might be over. From his college dorm, he called Colleen nearly every night, upset and on edge. No one suspected that Rick Church was coming unhinged. Hello? Hey, Colleen, it's me. How you doing? Hi, Rick. I'm fine. Yeah? What are you doing? Oh, I have a math test. Well, listen, I really haven't studied much. I, I have to go. Just called to talk to you for a second. That's not true. Look, I'm sorry. I just, I really have to study. I'll have to call you tomorrow. OK, fine. Well, good luck on your math test. Rick, I have been doing a lot of thinking. In June of 1988, Rick came home from college to find that his parents had separated and his girlfriend had reached a decision. So what are you, what are you getting at? I think we should see other people. I'm not good enough for you? At no, beginning of, this, of that I summer, he became very possessive. Um, you know, where are you going? Who are you going to be with? You know, that type of thing. And that, that just like, crowded me too much. I couldn't stand that. You were calling me all the time. I'm really sorry if I inconvenienced you. You're too possessive. What? I found it was really hard breaking up with Rick. I still wanted to be friends. We had known each other, you know, practically all our lives. And I did consider him a good friend. So I thought maybe this just wasn't, it was like a friendship trying to turn into a romance and it just didn't 
didn't cut it. <laughs> you know, it just didn't work. So then I just wanted us to be friends once again because he really didn't, he really needed somebody and I wanted to be, you know, a friend for him, but I just couldn't be his girlfriend anymore. It was too hard. Anyway, um, I went to this ghost. Two months later, on the night of Saturday, August 20th, Colleen had a friend sleeping over, as did her brother Matthew. Ray and Ruth Ann Ritter were out with friends, and their other son was away. Hello? Hi. At 11.30 p.m., Rick Church Nothing. telephoned, upset because he wanted one last Saturday night with Colleen. What about with some of my girlfriends? Where'd you go? He was kind of depressed. He sounded um, very depressed, very out. silent, really quiet. Um, like he, he knew something, he didn't want to tell me or something. And um, he immediately then I said, well, you know, don't talk to me like this. If you're going to act like this, you know, I don't want to talk to you tonight. I'll just talk to you tomorrow then. He said, well, fine. He just hung up on me. I don't, I don't know exactly how the fight started, but it ended up where he just hung up on me. I don't think there was, very, there was anything really unusual about that. We had gotten into arguments before, and he had hung up on me before, and I had done the same. It wasn't um, unusual, I don't think, in any circumstance. It was just a basic fight. Around 5.15 a.m., Rick Church entered the Ritter's house. What the police believe happened next is based on their investigation and eyewitness accounts. Ray and Ruth Ann Ritter were asleep in their ground floor bedroom. By 5.25 a.m., they were both dead. Upstairs, 11-year-old Matthew Ritter awoke. He was stabbed twice. Colleen frantically dialed 911. Rick broke into the room. She ran. Rick never spoke. He began to stab Colleen. Help me! Help me! I had a cedar chest, and I was like laying on the cedar chest, just pretending I was dead so he would stop, or just trying to do anything so he would stop. I was like playing dead, and that didn't work. He kept attacking me. Um, I told him, I just yelled out, I love you, just so I thought maybe he would stop. I was trying anything at that point. Rick fled when two neighbors came to Colleen's aid. Inside the house, young Matthew Ritter had managed to get to the telephone and give his address to the 911 operator. The police arrived almost immediately. Went that way, went back inside. It's okay, I'm an EMT. Operating under the false impression that Rick had run back into the Ritter house, the police concentrated their initial search efforts there. Matthew, bloody and in shock, huddled with his friend who was unharmed. Colleen's girlfriend had also escaped uninjured. In the downstairs bedroom, they found the bodies of Colleen and Matthew's parents. Meanwhile, Rick Church had run the 12 blocks to his home and was hurriedly packing his things. At 5.45 a.m., Rick took his mother's truck and vanished. Less than a half hour had elapsed since a bloody attack on the Ritter family. The Woodstock police issued an all-points bulletin. 
This was not a, a criminal or somebody that's hanging out on the street or anything like that. This was a kid who had gone to school here all his life and, you know, knew a lot of people and had a lot of friends and went on to college and then all of a sudden, you know, was accused of a crime like this. And I would think it'd be totally out of character for somebody like this. And I, I really don't know today yet uh, what the motive might have been. You know, speculation is the breakup, boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. Um, that's, to do something like this, uh, that's really something over that. But, you know, that's what we have at this point, the reason. Dr. Thomas, please call at the hospital, police put Colleen Ritter and her brother Matthew under 24-hour guard in case Rick Church showed up again. Hi. Hello. Matthew was treated and released the next day, but Colleen was critically injured with more than 20 stab wounds, most of them in the back of her head. Some of Colleen's doctors feared she would be permanently blind or suffer irreversible brain damage. Two days later, while Colleen was still in intensive care, her parents were buried. The hardest part uh, throughout all of this is, um, I guess, not having my parents there. That's real hard. Um, that's, that's two of your best friends and they're gone, so that's hard. And not, not being able to say goodbye because I wasn't at their funeral, that was hard. So I did that in my own way, and I still am. Next, the story of a risky undercover operation conducted by the FBI capture Colombian drug lords. In South America, the country of Colombia continues to fight for its life in the ugly war against drugs. The Colombian drug cartels have taken full credit for making terrorism and political assassination a way of life in their country and have made no secret of the fact that they want to increase their power in the United States. The cartels, the leaders of the cartels, the members of the cartels in South America and their representatives in the United States are particularly vicious. There is no premium on human life. These people make the mafia look like Boy Scouts. They are totally violent. They will kill almost for the sake of killing. Colombian drug cartels bring in more than $5 billion a year. In an effort to stem the tide of the cartel's influence inside our borders, the FBI three years ago mounted one of the riskiest sting operations in United States history. Because drug traffickers need, above all else, efficient and unbuggable telecommunications, the FBI set its trap in an electronics store. The sting operation began in May of 1987 in Miami, Florida. Its center was the unassuming RA Communications Company, which sold sophisticated telephone systems and electronic devices. The first customers were quick to arrive. Got some information on your uh, cellular phones. OK, well, we sell and service cellular phones. We also service beepers and sell beepers. What is it that you're interested in? The receptionist, Sandy, and the manager, Jay, were both highly trained Jay, FBI agents. These gentlemen would like to know about our cellular phones. Well, Sandy, do me a favor. Take messages. OK. The drug runners wanted the latest in car phones, ship-to-shore radios, beepers, remote phones, and airplane telecommunications devices. We did everything we could to provide them. By so doing, of course, we knew how they were operating, we knew what frequencies they were operating on, and it gave us the leg up. The drug trafficker's overriding need was for untraceable means of communication. The word on the street was R.A. had the best. All the employees at R.A. who were cooperating fully with the FBI were men the drug runners trusted. Now listen, this is the important thing, okay? Talk, talk to me, Ed. I'm gonna talk to the man in the moon, right? Now listen, I gotta know that the man in the moon's wife isn't listening in. Okay. You see what, I'm saying? what you wanna know is if this phone is tappable, right? And I'm telling you, listen to me now, trust me. There's no way 
you can tap into this phone. In your experience, there's no... I'm problem. an expert, I just told you. This is the top-of-the-line, state-of-the-art unit. We Trust held me, ourselves right? out as being anywhere. a service component of the drug business. Uh, we made it attractive for them to remain, talk, converse, and that became a place to congregate. It took on an aura of a clubhouse type of effect. Our clientele, probably six months into the operation, was entirely drug traffickers. Soon the really major players in the drug underworld began to drop into the RA clubhouse. One of them was Colombian national Jesus Peñalver, known by the FBI to handle regular shipments of cocaine worth as much as $50 million. Jesus came to trust the undercover agents and cooperative parties working in RA communications. Morning, hey, he bragged that he had been involved in some violent incidents in Colombia, South America, talked about his desire to flood the United States with cocaine. He freely discussed with us the movement from Colombia, South America, through the Bahamas and into the United States. Inside the clubhouse, Peñalver felt safe enough to make drug deals using the company phone. His conversations were videotaped and monitored by FBI agents. Peñalver's cronies joined him. And in the clubhouse, it was not uncommon to see as many as three different drug traffickers doing business simultaneously into the early morning hours. One of those traffickers was cartel operative Julio Marco Cruz. Oye, ¿qué está haciendo las cosas? ¿Te Julio? <laughs> Julio Marco Cruz was a customer, a purchaser, someone who was going to receive in excess of 100 kilos of cocaine. Cruz had arranged to receive his large cocaine shipment in early November on a boat called the Tremolo. Through RA's personnel, the FBI discovered the Tremolo's route in time to alert the United States Coast Guard. On November 19, 1988, the Tremolo entered U.S. waters, and the Coast Guard moved in to intercept the massive shipment of cocaine. Under the Tremolo's floorboards, agents discovered over 800 pounds of cocaine. Their street value, nearly $40 million. The next day, Cruz showed up at RA Communications accompanied by his bodyguards. Amazingly, he seemed to know nothing about the Tremolo's capture. Jay made a quick decision. To keep his cover intact, he told Cruz about the drug bust on the Tremolo. I read it in the paper, bro. Cruz was infuriated, but he never suspected that the men who told him about the bust were in fact responsible for it. He continued to use the same telephones he had used before, and the FBI continued to gather information. It appeared as if the RA sting might go on indefinitely. But during the fall of 1988, Jesus Peñalver had begun forcing his attentions on Sandy. Hi, Joe. Nada, working hard. The FBI feared that Sandy and their other agents might be in jeopardy. The agents who are involved in undercover activity are exposed to potential danger at any given time. If, if the circumstances were different, Okay. And really, we very closely reviewed and evaluated with the FBI headquarters and the other agencies who participated that uh, we had accomplished a great deal and it was the appropriate time uh, to bring forward the matters to uh, a prosecutive phase. On December 6, 1988, the FBI brought charges against nearly 100 drug traffickers. RA Communications was shut down. We had a significant amount of arrest to undertake. We had a very detailed plan. Of the 93 people indicted throughout the United States, we were able to apprehend 68 some people.
next week on Unsolved Mysteries. In 1965, one of the first black deputy sheriffs in Louisiana was gunned down in cold blood while on duty. 24 years later, new leads prompted the FBI to reopen the case. For every mystery, there is someone, somewhere, who knows the truth. Perhaps it's you. Thank you.